If you're looking for the second part related to KubeCon North America, then this episode is for you. Welcome back to the Is It Observable YouTube channel. As you can see here, it's not a traditional episode. I'm not in the studio. I'm in the conference of KubeCon North America in Chicago. Uh, if you followed the channel, you have seen that there is a first episode released a couple of weeks ago, and now we have the second episode covering more interviews because I delivered so much interviews on different products, uh, observability and security. So if you want to learn more and discover new tools, then don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. So let's go for the other part of the interviews in Chicago. So follow me in Chicago. a little bit jet lagged actually but um, everything fine since uh, two years as a maintainer in uh, Captain, which is an uh, incubator CNCF project. I do Go code, DevOps stuff, YAM, lots of YAML files in my life, Helm, Kubernetes. I quite like playing with Kubernetes. I made my own few kind of schedulers. So yeah. And you've also been teaching, I heard that. Yes, for uh, four and a half years, I was at uh, Alte University in Hungary. I was uh, teaching uh, university students about distributed systems and uh, many other fun computer science things. <laughs> so you're here at KubeCon on the Captain uh, CNCF Pavilion, Captain uh, Booth? Yes. So what is the most exciting news you want to share related to the Captain project? Probably if you are familiar with the project, you know that we really care about uh, helping you figuring out your uh, contract, your SLA, SLI, SLOs. And uh, now in our powered and uh, super cloud native new version of Captain, we can again do that in a very intuitive and easy to do way. Actually means that this is uh, fully based on Kubernetes native primitives. So the only thing you really need is a couple of custom defined resources and uh, you're good to go. Uh, there are three new custom resources we have introduced to allow you to calculate as low and as lies. The first one is the so-called analysis template. This is what helps you associate any of your favorite providers, think Prometheus, Dynatrace, Datadog, with your SLO calculation, your analysis calculation. This is the analysis template. Multiple analysis template can then be referred into what we call an analysis definition. This is where you actually talk about your objectives. So here is where you say, okay, I want my error rate to be less than x and uh, please fail if this is not satisfied so if you want to summarize with the sli slo word analyze mm -hmm. templates is the sli and slo in the slo will be the analysis definition the analysis value template is the metric so the sli yes yep. while 
the goal, the SLO, would be the analysis definition. Yes, where you see you have the objective and the reference to the template and uh, the scoring. And then finally, the act of having a snapshot of whether or not your SLO is uh, satisfied. So the checking of the contract is done via the analysis. So when you apply an analysis YAML, what you have there is a reference to the definition with all of the objectives. And you can decide for any time frame to see whether or not your uh, analysis, so your SLO SLI is satisfied. And here you will get a status results. This is nothing else that, again, easily jQueryable information. So your CR really contains all the information you need in a way which is 100% compatible with anything that can understand YAML or JSON. So I see args here. So uh, at the end, with the templates, you define what are the parameters of my query. Mm -hmm. And then when you define the analysis, this is where you say, oh, I want to uh, specifically uh, have the value for here in this case, in this example, the namespace, but I could also yes. say I want to have a, for a specific uh, uh, pod, having a specific selector, exactly. and so on. Exactly. So the powerful thing here is that we are separating the template, where you have the typical query that more or less never changes, for the specific of the analysis. So you can reuse the same template for multiple namespaces, and uh, you can reuse it for multiple snapshots of the same or of different applications. So at the end, the, the, the traditional uh, quality gate that were available in the Captain V1 now is currently fully compatible with Captain uh, Lifesize Toolkit. Yes. So if I, I'm running a test, and then after the test, I want to get the status of the quality gate, yes. uh, would, would I need to apply the analysis CRD just after my test? or this is applied and being evaluated every X minutes or so, because there is time frame. Mm -hmm. Time frame is where you define how often it's going to be evaluated. No, uh, time frame is uh, where you refer to exactly what time you want to analyze out of your uh, the metric that you have collected. Okay. So this can be either a specific time snapshot of time, or it can be the last five minutes, the last 10 seconds. So to, to have an evaluation, I need Basically, to do a cube kernel apply analysis, yes. and then a few seconds or yes. a few seconds yes. after that, I get the status. Yes, and if you want to have constant evaluation, this could be a cron job, this could be assigned to your own CCD pipeline. There are many ways you can decide how to schedule this sort of things. And if I go back to the uh, analysis definitions where you define the SLOs, uh, yes. uh, they, they were, so I can still see that we have the weight. Uh, yes. So basically, you can, you can differentiate um, SLO that are more important compared yes. to the others. Yes. And then also I see something key objective false. So it's the same concept that were available in the quality gates. Yes. So for example, it's... this SLO is critical and if it fails, that's it's that's the failing. end. It, everything fails. Yes. Awesome. So if I want to get started, what what do I need to do? Do I need to first deploy the uh, the captain metric server first? Yes. You you would need to go to our website. Here I share with you the URL. There you see that there is an instruction on how to install the metrics operator. And if you install the metric operator, then you just need to define these three files that I mentioned for so you. The, so the metric uh, operator now comes more, because previously in a, in a couple of months yes. ago, when you deployed the metric server, you had uh, the CRD of the captain provider, metric yes. provider and the captain metrics. Yes. And now the metric uh, operator yes. introduced those three new CRDs as well. Yeah, exactly. AWS, and I've been working on open telemetry since about 2018, 2019, uh, when I first got 
to work on the, the Go client library for a project that I was working on. So you're, main, you're contributing to the Go library, but uh, which project are you also working on? Uh, many of them, actually. Uh, so I've worked on the, the Go client library, I've worked on the collector, I've worked on the operator, I've worked on the Lambda uh, layers and instrumentation. Um, so I've done a little bit of everything all over the project. My interest is uh, the operator, open symmetry operator. I, I love the, the project, what it resolves, and uh, specifically the, the way it makes the open symmetry so much easier and faster. And I know that there is a lot of great news that happened recently on the operator. So could you, could you walk through the latest news? Uh, sure. So the, the operator um, is... Um, it's, it's a way to, to get the, the OpenTelemetry collector and automatic instrumentation up and running in your Kubernetes cluster easily. Um, I, I think it's, it's approaching a stability point now. Um, there's there's a, a bit of flux going on. Um, much of my work on the operator has been focused on a, a component of it, an optional component of it that we call the target allocator, which is uh, designed to help people who are um, using Prometheus uh, and scraping large sets of Prometheus metrics, um, where all of the data that needs to be processed might be more than one collector can handle. Um, and so, uh, a lot of our customers were saying, we've got very large clusters, we've got a lot of targets to scrape, uh, and it's, it's hard with a single collector uh, to, to do all of that, and it's really hard to figure out how to make multiple collectors not double up on scraping the same targets and producing the, the same metrics twice. Um, so we came up with the, what we call the target allocator, which is basically a way to separate out Prometheus' service discovery how it finds the targets it's going to scrape from the actual scraping and plucking of metrics from those targets. Uh, so what, what will happen when you set that up is the operator will create an, another pod that runs alongside your collectors uh, that does the service discovery, and it also keeps track uh, using the Kubernetes API of all of the collectors that are in that, that deployment, um, and it will try to evenly divide the targets that it discovers amongst the set of collectors. So if you've got you know, two collectors, it will pretty well evenly split them. If you've got 10 or 100, um, it will also do that. So if you've got you know, 50,000, 100,000 targets that you need to scrape, uh, and one collector just won't cut it, or you don't want to scale up you know, vertically um, because memory can get really expensive and you want to keep your memory footprint small, um, then that will be a big help of allowing you to kind of horizontally scale Prometheus metric collection. Which means at the end you, you don't need to define any scrap config anymore with that, with that uh, solution. Uh, yeah, so, so the target allocator can work with a predefined scrape configuration, um, you know, just like your, your normal Prometheus Kubernetes SD configs or static SD configs, but it can also work with the Prometheus operators service monitor and pod monitor resources, uh, which will define in Kubernetes uh, API resources the configurations for services as it discovers them. So you can have a common service uh, scrape configuration and say for every service that you discover um, in the Kubernetes API, then treat that as a new job in uh, Prometheus and go out and find all of the pods or endpoints on that uh, and collect metrics from those, again, allocated across all of the collectors that are in that set. And if I want, for example, to drop, uh, to drop metrics out of a given uh, service monitor or pod monitor, or if I want to uh, drop labels, uh, would I, do I need to create a script config? Or that is also possible with the other uh, You would. You would need to define your relabeling rules there. Um, so the relabeling rules will tell you which, which targets you want to keep or drop, and metric relabeling rules will allow you to define which metrics you want to keep or drop, or which labels you want to keep or drop or um, add uh, to, to what you collect. Um, and it uses the, the same Prometheus Discovery Manager and Scrape Manager um, implementations that Prometheus uses. So any Prometheus configuration that you've defined that works for a Prometheus server, you can also use with the operator and target allocated. And see, uh, if I have, for example, need to use any trans processor like uh, accumulating to Delta, uh, if I have several collectors, is there a recommendation way of doing it? Uh, or, or because at the end, you could mess around with your metrics if you don't want to do it well. So how do, how, what would be the best recommendation to do that? Um, I think the, the best recommendation is uh, to, as you say, use those processors that, that have already implemented those transformations. Um, your collector pipeline, once you've received all of the Prometheus metrics, will be the same for all of the collectors that are deployed in a, a set that's being managed by the operator and target allocator. Um, so all of those, that processing will happen in each of those collectors after you scrape the metrics. If I want to know, if I create a lot of service monitors, and where can I get some details about which endpoint is being currently scrapped by target allocator? Is that like a law or something that is produced? The target allocator has an API that reports all of the jobs that it's managing, all of the targets that it's discovered um, in those jobs, and which collectors it's allocated them to. Um, 
that's used by the collectors themselves. Um, the, the, what the operator actually does is it rewrites our collector config to use HTTP service discovery pointing at the target allocator. Um, so the collector will go ask the target allocator, hey, which targets do you have for me on a periodic basis? Uh, but you can also use that API yourself uh, to look at what has been discovered and allocated um, so that you can kind of debug how that is working. So if people want to have uh, documentation or details about the target allocator, where should they go to? Uh, so there's a readme in the in the operator repo of the target allocator, which describes the, the concept and, and how it works. Um, there's some documentation on the OTO, open, opentelemetry.io site. Um, and I believe there have been some blog posts as well um, from people in the community who have described their experiences with it and, and how they've used it. Um, some of which I believe are also linked from the opentelemetry.io site. technology strategist with Dynatrace. So we're here today talking about developer observability. Um, what that really means is, you know, developers, when they need access to debug data, most of the time they need to know what they want ahead of time, right? They have to have the right logs in their code. They have to have access to the right environments. They have to have someone to approve their PRs. And so what we're here doing is talking about how we can make developers' lives easier by giving them immediate and instant access to that debug level data while their applications are running without having to restart or redeploy their apps. So um, what does it actually mean? Can you show us in the product what the, this, this develop, 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 develop means? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's take a look at how we can, uh, from within a running application, automatically and immediately on demand collect that debug level data. So. I'm looking at Dynatrace's topology view. Um, it's discovered a few problems in one of our applications. The application that's running, uh, it's called Easy Trade. It's a microservices based application running on Kubernetes. And let's take a look at how we can debug an issue within one of those, those services. So Dynatrace has automatically detected that there's a number of problems occurring within the application. I can see that there's some failure rates increasing. Um, the broker service is having some problems. And as a developer of that service, it's a, it's a .NET service, I may want to dive deeper to understand exactly what's happening. So to start, what I can do is I can dive into uh, the problems view, where I can see some information about what services were impacted, uh, what the business level impact was, and even what a potential root cause might be of that service. So I can drill in, and I can see more detailed information. I can see that there's failures happening. I could even dive in and view things like distributed traces, uh, view logs associated with that application. But as a developer, sometimes I may want to dive even deeper to really understand what's happening at the code level. So what I can do is I can take advantage of Dynatrace's live debugger. And for that, what I'm going to do is I have a workflow attached that's automatically added a link uh, to the live debugger. And so I'm just going to click on that. And what it does is it automatically pops up uh, the live debugger. Uh, and it has selected our broker service, which is where the problem is occurring. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click Next. Uh, it connects automatically into your source code. So wherever the code is running GitHub, Bitbucket, we're able to automatically fetch the right version of code that's running in your environment. And then uh, what we're able to do is you can open up any uh, file within your code base, and you can start to set uh, what we call non-breaking breakpoints. So I'm just going to click on a couple lines of code here. And as I do that, it sets these breakpoints. Now, these are very similar to breakpoints that you would set in your local debugger, but they're not going to actually pause or stop your application like your traditional debugger would. Think of it as like an in-memory snapshot where you're going to capture variable values, stack traces, all sorts of information, and then allow you to understand exactly what's happening at those points. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back uh, within our application. I'm going to trigger the problem again. So I'm going to go ahead and select uh, a, a trade. We can see immediately there are some errors happening within the application itself. So I saw uh, those failures happening. And as I did that, I'm able to immediately come down and see, OK, we actually hit line 53, line 55 of the code. 
we didn't quite make it to line 57 after we had tried to save those changes to our database. So I'm able to come in and see code level details and information. So Dynatrace is pointing me to the fact that, okay, there were some failures, there were some exceptions happening within the code. Now as a developer, I'm able to go down to the code level, I can see which account did this happen in? Um, what were the details of the trade at the code level? What were those variable values? What was the stack trace in terms of how we got here? Which specific pods was it occurring on? And just getting that on-demand detail to really be able to solve the problem much more quickly and efficiently. Can I, for example, uh, once you have enabled the debugger, have a connection between a distribute trace and that level of detail saying, oh, this trace, because we enabled, I see that uh, account ID is six. Yeah. And then on the trace, I can also have information back, 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 uh, available on the distribute trace as well. Yeah, absolutely. There's a bunch of really cool use cases that we can now do um, with this solution, right? So you can have a distributed trace that perhaps automatically captures the data that you want ahead of time and kind of links you to the right places, uh, gathers the right data, so you have all of the context that you need to solve that, that problem. So if I want to take advantage of this, what, what is the journey? Do I need to install a specific agent? Do I, what, what, what do I need to do? Yeah, so Dynatrace uh, uses a single agent called the one agent. Um, all of this is gonna be encompassed within that agent. So all you need to do is deploy the latest version of one agent and you'll be able to take advantage of, of, of this capability. Portugal. I'm the product lead of TestCube. It's an amazing product uh, for testing. Uh, I'm here to talk about testing. TestCube is a test orchestration management framework. The cool thing about it is it allows you to run any type of test in Kubernetes environments in a very cloud native way. Is it like is it an operator? Is it uh, something that you deploy that will basically orchestrate the various tests? How does it work? Exactly. So it it's, um, gives a very uh, simple way to observe all of your tests that run across all of your clusters. It's mostly about integration tests, load testing, API testing. You can use it to test uh, your front end with Cypress, Playwright, like many tools. So we are agnostic to the tools that you use. We just care that they run inside the container. We take those containers, run it for you, and give you a dashboard like the one you can see here with all of your tests in a very easy to consume way. So, so, how do, so how do you configure a, a test? Do you have a specific CRD or you do a deployment or? Exactly, everything in, in test cube is a CRD, including the test. So here I have already tested the equipment before. Uh, there's some test integrations already done here, as you can see with the log output, and if they pass or fail, and if I go here to the definition of the test, the CRT. So the users of TestCube, they don't need to know uh, pretty much about Kubernetes. Uh, they can just use the UI or the CLI, but underneath we leverage Kubernetes a lot. We deploy everything in the CRDs and we integrate with all the tools <coughs> for uh, GitOps, including Argo CD, uh, Flux. You can take these CRDs, put them in your Git repos, and they will uh, automatically synchronize with your Kubernetes cluster. So here I see a K6, a K6 script. I see one thing that I, first of all, I love is the fact that you have uh, data is the actual entire uh, K6 script. Mm -hmm. um, how do I, because K6 comes with different plugins, so how can I customize the image of K6 that I want to use? Exactly, so we have a, a framework inside test script called executors. Uh, so also uh, a CRD. So what, what you do is you define a Docker image with all those extra plugins, and then define them in TestCube. So you have your custom key six executor with a Docker image, and TestCube just takes that image and runs it for you inside the Kubernetes shop. So you can have like a test that you trigger once. So you, do you trigger it from uh, an API perspective, from kubectl, or mm -hmm. from uh, the UI perspective? How do you execute a test? Yeah, so there's many ways to trigger a specific test. Depending on the use case of, of the team, you can trigger it manually, as you can see here. You can trigger it on uh, a schedule, for example. You can trigger it every X minutes as a, a cron job. You can trigger it from a CI CD pipeline, as an example. Let me show you here a GitHub action. So if you use GitHub actions, you can use a quickly have a step that runs a test, and if the test fails, the step in the pipeline will also fail. And so you don't, you don't you know, continue your deployments. And uh, also another 
cool feature that TestCube has is that it allows you to listen for cluster events and then trigger tests. It's an example, TestCube could listen for a deployment that is modified and uh, um, when, when you change the image, TestCube can run a test for you. Usually when the image changes on the deployment, it's just because you just deployed a new version, right? So TestCube can wait for that event to happen and then trigger the test. Do you have like a specific framework or do you use JUnits? How can I expose my results back to TestCube so then I can track the results of each individual test? Exactly, so inside the uh, test, there's uh, two main ways. The first one is we TestCube checks the exit code or the command that runs inside the, the pod. So if it's um, the exit code is zero, it passed. If it's non-zero, it's failed. So we'll, we'll look at that. We also look at uh, the logs. So that's the main thing you can do, and very easy. Most of the, the teams and the companies just use that. They don't. Uh, they just have pass or fail, and then they look at the logs and give a, a report. They can have a unit report, but they don't use that to conclude if it passes or fails. They just use it for post analysis of the whole execution. With that said, there's also, it's possible to, you, that you can use some logic uh, around your unit reports that based on certain criteria, you can do other actions. Like you can read the unit report and then from your session, you can you know, decide what to do based on that. And you mentioned the logs here. So do you have like a parser to say, what, what would we decide if it's green or red here? Do you have like a specific parser that says, oh, yeah. Uh, with this pattern, it means green, and this pattern means uh, error? Yeah, yeah, mostly it's the exit code. We want to look at the logs and then fail it for you. But that could be a, a, a nice feature to have that we, if we see a, the, error, the, the message error, we can make the test fail for the user because there's an error somewhere, uh, unless he doesn't want it to be. So the end test cube is, a, is an orchestrator. It's because you rely on containers, you can basically run any any solution of the market. Yeah, any solution, any type of test, we we are agnostic. We, do, we pretty much don't care what type of test you run. Okay, because here I see uh, behind you that there is Casey's Playwright, there is uh, uh, Cypress, SoPio, JMeter. Yeah. Do, do you, when you uh, announce that you support those tools, do you provide like a like a way of uh, processing the results? Uh, out of the box of those solutions? Exactly. So out of the box, as you come shipped with several testing tools that are predefined, so you don't have to create token image for them. So those ones are, uh, let's say, more configured in a more professional way, right away, because they work out of the box. You just have to give it your files and they run it. So those ones uh, are the ones that, if, if you have those tests, will be work very well for you, because you don't have those Docker images. Uh, but if you have to create the Docker images, you can also do the same stuff. It's just that you have to know how to handle Docker files. So, for example, if you want to hear when you create a test, you just have to select the ones that are already come shipped with TestCube here, uh, or create a new one. Running a single test, then for, for Teams, it's not just about running a single test, it's also about orchestrating multiple ones. So running them in parallel, you can create complex workflows. So for example, you can have a, a, an entire test suite where you have four tests running in parallel, uh, then have some conditions. If you want, let's say one of the tests fail, you want to abort the whole test suite, or maybe, okay, maybe one can fail, so you can continue. Um, so there's like a lot of different setups that you can create. Do you have a CRD where you can, do you, for sure, is, it, is it an auger workflow that you have? or? Yeah, we have a CRD that, uh, so all the our test suites and all of our resources are CRD. We can put them, we advise our users to put them in Git. And then Argo CD would uh, uh, synchronize those CRDs to the cluster. So, if uh, the community wants to start using TestCube, uh, how can they use it? Is it, is it? I guess it's open source? Yeah, it's uh, open source. You should go to testcube.io, uh, click on the Getting Started Guide. We have a guide that allows you to quickly set it up, deploy it on your cluster, and run a test in less than five minutes. As long as you have a great cluster that it can run on, it should be fine. Ninja. So what is Flux Ninja about? So we focus on like 
peak load management and the problem we are solving is if you have like few hours in your day when you have like peak load traffic spike coming in how do you prevent issues with performance issues timeouts user experience and preserve user experience during those peak load hours there's a secret sauce behind that's it's interesting like... right so <clears throat> so we offer a bunch of techniques to manage peak load one of the things we do which people really love is like quota system where let's say you have an application where sometimes your bottlenecks could be some databases your bottlenecks could be some services what we allow you to do is like one of the basic techniques is you set a quota where you can say I, my cluster can only do 10,000 requests per minute or per second, whatever that is. We enforce that number for you. And what we do is like interestingly work backwards from that number to help prioritize the request. So idea is that every worklet that you see, there could be some API calls which are higher priority than the others. Sometimes you have some users which are higher priority than other users. So what we allow the users to do is like provide the best SLA possible during the peak load hours to your critical API calls while we queue up and uh, do graceful degradation for some of the background jobs of the low critical workloads. And we do that through a lot of the scheduling. So think of Flux Ninja as being a scheduler for the APIs. How do you get the data? Because you mentioned you, know, you detect peak hours. So I guess you rely on observability data. Do yeah. you collect the data by yourself or you rely on existing backends? The solution has a few moving parts. Uh, let's talk about a few things. Like one is like insertion. So what we're doing is installing agents as a daemon set on Kubernetes cluster next to the service and what we're offering is like this flow control as a service so if you have developers they can use our SDKs so the idea is that before you call your heavy workload you wrap your workload with a flow start and end call and we protect the workload with rate limiting giving prioritization and so on the other way we are doing integration to the app is through service meshes so if you have Istio we actually implement the rate limiting service on that through external authorization API so you can use OPA Rego style rules in Flux Ninja platform to classify workloads. So instead of authorization, you can do the flow control with this platform where you can say, record my GraphQL API. This is how I identify my users. This is the job token, decode that, figure out whether it's a gold tier user. And based on that label, do rate limiting, prioritization, and so on. So, so you mentioned Istio. Do you have also support for Linkerd, Kuma? And yes, others? at this time we support Envoy Proxy because it's the Envoy's uh, external auth API. Anyone on by base could use our platform. We also support gateways. So anyone building on Nginx, uh, Kong, Nginx, we support through the Lua plugin model, uh, where we are like a sidecar to a sidecar. And what we're doing is like providing all this global counting. So our agents are actually a distributed global state where we are maintaining accurate counts of per user, per transaction kind of, um, uh, and then do rate limiting on that in quotas. FlexNinja provides its own backend to do that because we have tuned the observability stack slightly differently than your normal observability. So what we are doing is, that's why we're calling it observability delivery and road management. So we are picking up things like access logs, even like saturation signals, where you could like say, if my service is 80% CPU utilization, throttle it, throttle that request so that I can then prioritize, right? While I scale up, like I could be doing horizontal scaling, which takes time. Sometimes your scaling databases can take 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And during that period of time, you're vulnerable. You can have cascading failures, performance issues, users complaining. So during that period of time is we are able to take the observability data and do adaptive throttling onto your incoming requests. And we can do this on database signals. For example, we look at active connections on PG SQL. Because if you're gonna run out of 100, if you're, act, if you're running out of connections on a database, yeah. you will have timeouts, it's bad. You will have cascading failures, retry storms, a lot of bad things can happen. So we actually stabilize the app so think of it like the way you actually implement graceful degradation. So the, actually the demo I'm gonna show you is actually pretty interesting. Now that everyone's talking about AI, we actually have customers on AI. So this is a customer which is doing code reviews using OpenAI GPT-4. And every morning they have peak load. A lot of people open pull requests on GitHub, hundreds of files getting reviewed every minute. Now interestingly, the GPT-4 has very, very aggressive rate limits. Everyone knows that they have GPU shortage and they don't have capacity. So they have very aggressive limits that they enforce. So what this customer, the way we took them to production, if you look at this graph over this side, you see the incoming token rate is very spiky. And when it comes out of the aperture system, we are actually flattening the peak load. So you have spiky load, we have flattened it. And while we did that, we did queuing and prioritization. So this customer has their end users could be paid users. So pay attention to the blue line, which is a paid user. We give them the best SLA. 
least wait times, fastest access to the open AI service. So it's a quota we are enforcing and then prioritizing against that quota. Then there's a medium tier, which is the trial user, red line, which is the medium tier. So they have to wait a little bit longer for the code reviews to complete. Then the green line is open source user. They're giving the service for free for open source, so you can load shed even. So they get the worst performance. And interestingly, there's also an orange line, which you will notice, because the users also have the chat capability, interactive request to AI. So we speed up those the most. So interactive use cases go in the fastest. How do you recognize the paid user, the, yeah, the very, trial users based on headers? Very interesting yeah. question. It's very similar to tracing baggage. So as a, let's say I'm a developer and I'm using my SDK, then I'm providing the key value labels. I'm identifying user equal to paid, model equal to GPT-4, and based on the labels, we match the policies and do all the, all the, all the prioritization is based on labels, rate limiting, and so on. And, and these labels are also picked up from service mesh. These are headers, or you can write OPA rules, or REGO rules, to look inside the payload and extract labels. Anything, anything you can, business attributes, you can extract and write a policy on. So you mentioned rate limiting, I guess you also say good. Conservative circuit breaker rule or timeout time request. Right. Time out request. So interestingly, like our solution, like circuit breaking, usually traditionally has been like health checking single pod, and if it's unhealthy, you circuit break against one pod. So what we are doing is like more service level throttling. Like we are aware of the entire like cluster of pods which forms a service, how much saturation on an average it's uh, consuming, and then working backwards from that. So we're bringing service awareness to service mesh. At the end, you are you are assisting or you are driving the configuration that needs to be that needs to be done for a service mesh perspective. Yeah. So idea is like if you have workload, you want to wrap it with this layer because first of all, you need visibility in this layer. So for each label, we are providing deep visibility for this customer. You can see how much like GPT-4 performance looks like because it's all in the labels. It can be your HTTP headers. It can be anything. So deep visibility is one. Second reason to use is rate limiting. So you have customers, you still want to prevent abuse. The way you do load management is first prevent abuse. Don't even admit the calls if someone has a bad script running or something. The third strategy is what I showed you, prioritization. Even if I'm exceeding capacity, I want to slow down. The fourth strategy which we are on our roadmap, which we are rolling out in two weeks is caching. You want to like cache. Don't even make these expensive calls if you have just recently made it. So we're going to provide an in-cluster cache on Kubernetes next to service mesh for one of its kind. Like it's a cache in the cluster, high performance, better than Redis, built on the same technology. Service discovery is actually built into this platform. So we know exactly which services are talking which and the performance, and we can actually map it out. Uh, what would be the journey if I want to, to deploy a Ninja, Flux Ninja in, in my cluster? It's very interesting. Like a lot of the times, it's actually the product teams who want to prioritize because they have a pain point. They have to work with constraints. So I would say like more than service mesh, SDKs are seeing a lot more um, attention because you don't have to reverse engineer the traffic. You can put the right labels in the code. And also like we have provided uh, like a serverless option where we have a SaaS service. So most of the times, just to get a quick POC, don't even install the agents. Just do it against our cloud see if it adds value, and then ask your infrastructure team to deploy agents. Okay. And uh, if I want to, uh, what is the, do they have a freemium, a feature? Uh, Interestingly, it's open source, actually. Apache V2 license. And to be honest, at some point, we would love to donate it to CNCF. It's just not ready for them yet. So, but as we are like stabilizing the APIs, this could be a CNCF project in the future. And it's, uh, it's an open source project. Check out our GitHub. So if I want to get news, where should I uh, go to? GitHub repo? Do you have a yeah, website? GitHub repo, Flux Ninja, uh, and within that you have Aperture. That project name is easier to remember. You are coming, like in photometry, you have Aperture. You are controlling the light coming into your camera. So just like that, it's an Aperture for your services. We control the flux coming into your services in a, and then stabilizing your services. It's like a seat belt. Jason Plum, and uh, I work with Splunk, and I contribute to OpenTelemetry on the Java projects, and I'm a maintainer on OpenTelemetry Android. So we're sitting right now inside the OpenTelemetry Observatory here at KubeCon, and um, we had a bunch of sessions that we were hosting. A session I hosted earlier was on real user monitoring and client-side instrumentation uh, within OpenTelemetry for, for the purposes of helping instru in, instrument 
um, applications so that they can appear in Rome, our real user monitoring solutions. Kind of the, I think the original, maybe most mature, oldest uh, one right now is our JavaScript um, client instrumentation. And that, that helps to facilitate uh, creating telemetry um, on the client side in a web app. There's also some Swift instrumentation that I know almost nothing about, but it can help with iOS. And then Android instrumentation, um, that Splunk donated to OpenTelemetry that is in its infancy, but is uh, rapidly growing through community support. So when it comes to Android uh, instrumentation, what does it mean? Can you add the SDK to the Android code application, and then you're manually building traces, or how does it work? That's a good question. So. Um, yeah, originally uh, there's a few uh, calls to set up or configure the SDK for your purposes, the Android SDK. Uh, sorry, the instrumentate, the Open Telemetry Android SDK. Um, so yeah, just a couple of lines of code in your application, and then you can get instrumentation out of it. That instrumentation includes a lot of the client side concerns, so um, cra like crash detection, crash handling, um, slow rendering detection, user activity, and then linking that user activity and workflow in the app with other telemetry like spans and traces that might be emitted. To be able to trace things like user clicks, user activity, changing between different screens, uh, when a user logs in, maybe when they log back out, all of that uh, user-centric activity. And what is, is it create like a trace ID and then the trace ID is, is sent back to the back end and the trace continue with back and forth? So this is still very much a work in progress. So I'm, I'm hesitant to say the way it works today or to commit to that. Um, right now on Android, the telemetry is span-based. We are rapidly switching to be event-based because you can imagine that things like a button press, uh, the, mo the data model maps uh, more closely to an event than it might a span where it may not have any duration. And it's also not necessarily a span that would have child events associated with it. It's just a singular event that happened in a moment in time. So that is rapidly changing. Um, Did you use the OTLP protocol to then push the front data back to uh, collector or backend, or is it another project? So because we're built on the Java SDK, we have completely pluggable exporters. Uh, the, the default that we will be switching to, there's an open issue right now to switch to the OTLP exporter as our default. So yeah, that's what the community rallies behind, it's what we want. Um, so that will likely be the default happening soon. Okay. I want to clarify something about instrumentation because we were talking about that too um, in the application code. Um, we're also adding auto instrumentation to Android, which leverages bytecode manipulation at build time through Gradle plugins in order to instrument common libraries like OK, OK HTTP and other client side uh, common libraries. What is the difference with what the Android uh, SDK is able to provide and the one that the Node of the JavaScript uh, SDK is able to provide? Yeah, so a slightly different experience between like a rich web app and an Android client. Um, some different concerns are that, especially on mobile devices, uh, they might the user of that device might uh, turn off data for a while, they could go into airplane mode, they might go out of range. So there's some concerns around buffering of telemetry and some different concerns that, that might not be the same or as necessary on, as browser. on browser, yeah. What type of details would I get if I start instrumenting my browser application on the, with the JavaScript framework? Well, again, still very much a work in progress, but um, we're looking at things like page load. Um, we're looking at um, time to first render. Uh, anytime there's an exception, like an exception that gets uncaught, unhandled exception handling, um, and all of that additional user activity, like logins, logs out, logouts, and then. Today's episode related to KubeCon North America, the second part of uh, the series on KubeCon North America. So again, 
a lot of interviews, a lot of interesting product. Uh, I will be very interested to figure out, to know which solution makes more sense for you. So please drop a comment below. And if the solution is interested, I may do a deep dive related to that solution. So uh, thanks for watching. So if you enjoyed this content, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. So see you soon for a traditional episode on technology. Bye.